so we were uh, do a class right before this, and uh, we're talking about what well, we're going to be talking about in a couple weeks: the beast and the mark of the beast stuff. And I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, manage my time that well because there's just so much stuff to talk about. So uh, I should manage my time pretty well, our time together tonight, without too many hiccups. Um, so, um, but anyway, so I'm really glad to see you. I uh, hope that you're doing well. Today we're going to be talking about um, how to read Revelation. How to read Revelation, which might sound like a huge topic, okay? Um, but it's something that we can we can address pretty easily and just give us some principles for how to read Revelation. So my my goal really is to just put some tools in your toolbox so that you can go home and and build cool stuff. Okay. Um, this might be my one of my favorite talks that I do because for me Revelation is has always been enigmatic, weird, mysterious, kooky, or whatnot, and I always like to demystify this wonderful book because it's a great book. I, I think it's a book that gets a bad rap. I you know I I have um, uh, you know. I don't, I don't have bad memories reading Revelation. I just have confusing ones. You know what I mean? You're like, what does this even mean, right? And so my job, my goal, my passion is to just help the Bible go from black and white to uh, 3D maybe or, you know, 4K or whatever it is now. And we can appreciate those images better than we than maybe previously before. So ha- hopefully after today we'll, we'll, we'll look at some, some fun principles uh, some easy things we can do to uh, read Revelation, such that after today, you may go home and just start reading it. And, uh, and I, I know you'll be blessed when you do, because Revelation, as one scholar said, is a practical book. It's filled with prayer. It's filled with worship. It's filled with tears of lament, uh, you know, songs of joy. All the things that is very human that we go through, and I think Revelation could be a good prayer book in many respects, it could be a good cry book. It could be a good joy book. Um, and it's a good book of hope. Um, I always say, if you're reading Revelation and you walk away afraid, then you're reading Revelation wrong. Or you're a devil. <laughs> One of the two. Because Revelation was written to be a book of hope. And if you're reading it as a book of fear, you're reading it wrong. And as fo- so far as I know, the, the, the only side in Revelation that doesn't do well in the end is the evil side, right? And so either way, you're reading it wrong. You should e- read it through the eyes of hope and through the eyes of Christian faith. If you don't have Christian faith, well, this is a good book to start reading because I think it'll push you toward, toward that end. Um, and so, so that's just what I like to say is, uh, you know, you want to read it rightly. Um, I have a friend, a uh, brother in Christ, who he just he, he told me one time, he said, I, I just can't read Revelation. It gave me nightmares. I think when he read it one time, it just really gave him nightmares. And I could totally get that. Like, I don't laugh at that because, like, yeah, I can get it. I mean, if you read some of it, it's, 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 sometimes it's difficult to understand. Um, so it's, it's just a normal sort of uh, thing that many Christians struggle with. And I, I just want us to, to read Revelation uh, for all it's worth and all that we can get out of it. Okay, without further ado, let's jump in. So this is a great, great quote, one of my favorites. Revelation is a strange book, nearly as strange as some of its readers. It's a really good quote, right? comes from uh, N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd, New Testament scholars, very well respected. Uh, and um, I think it captures sort of the way Revelation has been misused through the centuries um, and, and even in popular, uh, I mean, modern times, uh, modern po- prophecy teachers come up with some crazy things about Revelation that it just leaves you scratching your head thinking, my goodness, what are they doing with this book? It is a strange book. Let's just grant it, okay? But many of its commentators um, are perhaps stranger, <laughs> right? Um, Charles Spurgeon, the great British pastor of the 19th century, he said, uh, one of the great proofs that the Bible is in the inspired word of God is that it has endured thousands of years of poor preaching. <laughs> I thought that's a really good. You could, you could apply that to all the, the many books that have been written on Revelation as well. Um, so, uh, but, you know, it's not just modern era that has a problem with understanding Revelation. 
Um, uh, there's another quote I, I found. You can all this stuff you can go look up yourself. Uh, the next quote you can find online, actually at the United States government website, National Archives, which I highly recommend if you want to do historical research or on it and stuff. Go to the National Archives. It's as far as I know free. But I, I ran by this quote, and um, and it's it's always one that's really captured my attention. Um, but anyway, it comes from uh, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. He says that revelation is the ravings of a maniac, no more worthy nor capable of explanation than the incoherences of our own nightly dreams. From Thomas Jefferson. Uh, yeah, so th this is, it comes from a letter that he was writing to his friend. His friend, if I recall, wrote a book of some sort on revelation and sent it to Thomas and was like, hey, could you look this over? What do you think? And he says, he writes back, he says, I haven't read Revelation in a long time. Um, and, uh, but, and then he goes on about why Revelation is just whack. And I think he even, I think he, no, this is, I'm getting him confused with somebody else. Anyway, this is what he says. And again, this is just in a letter. You can go find this on, on the website. You can just go Google it. Um, makes sense, though, for Thomas to say this. Thomas Jefferson was an uh, interesting guy, a political genius, don't get me wrong, but, um, but you wouldn't want him teaching Sunday school, <laughs> okay? That's what, that's what one guy, uh, Russell Moore, said one time. Great political strategist, terrible person you don't want to uh, teach Sunday school. Not terrible person, but just had bad eyes that about the Bible. He's, he's well known, if, if, if you're not familiar with Thomas Jefferson, he was pretty much the classic American Enlightenment scientific sort of person. He, he was a, someone who, who respected religion. He respected uh, even Christianity. He had a lot of fondness for Christianity. But at the end of the day, he was a man of science. He was a man of enlightenment and modernity. You know, we, uh, we don't really need God or the Bible to tell us, um, to give us revelation. Um, we, can, we can attain that through our own reason. Uh, that's why, you know, you might hear... Uh, early American writings, they'll say things like, it is self-evident, you know, all, you know, we are created uh, with certain inalienable rights. There's self-evident truth. This is an enlightenment principle that it's just reason alone tells us these things. Yeah, reason tells us there's a God and everything, but but reason tells us that, you know, you should treat people with respect. And that that that's really sort of an enlightenment principle that you don't, you don't really get basic truth from divine revelation, but God has instilled it within reason itself, and we get it through that. Well, there's a lot we can, you know, we can agree with the Enlightenment on some things, but, but, um, but one thing that, that the Enlightenment did is it produced sometimes people like Thomas Jefferson who didn't like all the supernatural stuff in the Bible. Um, because he's a man of science, it, you know, supernatural stuff, miracles, ghosts and demons and all of that kind of thing, uh, science doesn't, you know, let's, let's, let's think a scientific explanation of things. Um, we don't need spiritual explanations because we're men of science. You know, it's the 18th century for crying out loud. And, um, and so he comes up with his Jefferson Bible. Have you, are you fam who's familiar with the Jefferson Bible? Yeah. Uh, do, do, you, do you know what's unique about the Jefferson Bible? You remember? He <laughs> cut out all the supernatural. Yeah. <laughs> You can go to Barnes and Noble. Sometimes I see it at Barnes and Noble. They sell it there. You know, you can go. I, I want to buy it, but it's like so expensive. I'm like, ah, I'm never going to read this. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, but yeah, he loved the moral teachings of Jesus: love your neighbor as yourself, be kind to one another, all that. I mean, the great stuff he says. Um, but you know, Jesus rising from the dead, you know, healing people. Ah, that's just that. That's not true. That's a myth. Um, which. Coming to Revelation, you know that about Thomas Jefferson. It makes sense why he would say this, because Revelation is full of, like, angels and demons and fight, you know, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, this is crazy, you know, the ravings of a maniac. Um, well, okay, but um, uh, this just kind of shows you, this quote and the one previous, um, really shows you that Revelation has not always been well-received. Um, it has not always been understood. And I don't think it's the cravings of a maniac. I don't think it's, it's a book that is on par with just irrational dreams. I actually think there's a lot of logic to the book, but the key is unlocking the logic and trying to find it. The, the problem with Thomas Jefferson's view of Revelation and many people's view of Revelation is that they try to read it through modern eyes. Uh, he's a man of science. He's trying, you know, he's, uh, is trying to read it through scientific enlightenment lens, but you can't do that. 
you have to read Revelation in light of its first century context. You have to read it in light of its Jewish and Greco-Roman, Greek-Roman context. Then it begins to make more sense. And then you're like, okay, I see what he's doing here. Um, So understanding Revelation, let's get into it. These are all on your sheets. There's just four blanks or so that you can fill out. But it's all about genre. Everybody say genre. It's a good, you know, Frenchy sounding name or word. Genre. Um, I have no idea if it came from the French. I don't know. But um, genre, what is genre? Well, essentially, genre is, um, see, what do I got up here? Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, genre refers to the kind of writing that a piece of literature is. Okay, so we go to Barnes & Noble, and we see books categorized by genre. There's a science fiction genre. There's a histor- history genre. Um, there is poetry. That's a genre. There is, um, uh, you know, sports or whatever. There's philosophy. There's all different types of genre. Um, and knowing what a a writing or a text or a book's genre is will help you understand the book. I always like to give this example. Suppose that that you pick up a book and you don't know what the genre is, but you pick up a book and it's it's um let's just say it's science fiction, okay? And but you don't know it's science fiction. You think it's a science textbook, okay? And you open it up and you begin reading about how oh, there's a guy getting in a spaceship, and he's going to go in a spaceship. Oh, okay, it makes sense. We do that all the time, NASA and everything. Um, so it's not that weird. But then he, he flies to the moon. You're like, oh, okay, we fly to the moon. You know, we've done that. Nothing weird. That's science. He gets out of the spaceship, walks around on the moon. Yeah, I can believe that. Then he sees little green men coming up and talk to him. Perfect English. I hadn't really seen that yet, you know. And then all of a sudden, the green man puts his hand on his head and now the guy can fly without a spacesuit. Okay, that's not science. This is kind of weird. So is this author lying to me? Is this author trying to say that this is actual science? Because if he is, he's lying to me. He's trying to deceive me. Well, no, 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 not at all. You've just missed the genre, that it's science fiction. In science fiction, you can do that sort of stuff, right? Um, that's why it's important if you go to read a book. This sounds so simple, doesn't it? When you go to read a book, you want to know the genre. And we do that naturally. But when it comes to the Bible, we don't often do that naturally. Uh, For example, uh, the Bible is full of all kinds of different genres. And today we're going to talk about the genres of Revelation. Because Revelation actually has multiple genres. Uh, but, But the whole Bible itself is made up of 66 different books. Some books are different than the others because they're different genres. And if you mess up the genre, you'll mess up the meaning of the book. Case in point, this happens all the time. You flip over to the book of Proverbs... Or maybe you hear a sermon on Proverbs, or maybe you're doing your daily devotion in Proverbs. And you come to the, pro- the, the proverb that says, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. I'm going to raise my kids in the way they should go, and when they're old, they're not depart from it. So let's pretend you raise your kids in the way they should go, and when they get old, you expect them not to depart from it. You've done everything right, not perfect, but it doesn't say it to be perfect. You just have to raise them in a, you know, a good godly Christian environment. And then they grow up and they leave you. Or they do something terrible. Or they disobey and become rebellious or whatnot. Man, did the Bible lie to you? Well, I don't want to say that because it's the word of God. Well, maybe I didn't. Maybe I was a terrible parent. Maybe I'm like a terrible parent. Look how my child didn't. You know. No, it doesn't have to be either one of those things thing about it is, that's a proverb, not a promise. There's a huge difference. Because the proverbs is of the genre wisdom literature, or proverbial literature, proverbial writings. All a proverb is, well, let me start with by saying what a proverb is not. A proverb is not a promise that's true 100% of the time. A proverb is a general truth that is true generally, all things being equal, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't dismiss the idea that there could be other factors coming into play that could change it all up, right? The proverbs, in, when you read proverbs, if you know the genre, you know that, that it actually invites you to be creative with it, 
You know, Proverbs, if you read it like a promise book, man, you're going to be so disappointed. Case in point, there's Proverbs that says, if you work hard, this is my paraphrase, if you work hard, you'll be wealthy. But I know people who've worked hard, and they're not what we would call wealthy. You know, why not? Well, okay, some people work really, really hard, and they're not wealthy because they spend way too much, right? (laughs) They can work really, really hard, and they earn their $60,000 a year paycheck. But if you're spending $80,000 a year, only making $60,000, you're not going to be wealthy, right? So that's just a factor that gets factored in. Does that mean the Bible's lying to you? No, because it's a proverb, because not all things are equal. There's other factors, right? It's just a general truth that if, generally speaking, yeah, you work hard, generally you're successful. Also the case, um, there's a proverb that says, you don't work, you don't eat. I've seen a lot of people not work and still eat. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Uh, you see, but what is it like? No, it's just a proverb that means, generally speaking, if you don't work, if you're a couch potato, right? You, you don't have a job, you can't keep a job, then you're probably not going to make some money. You know, you get my point, right? They're proverbs. But when, you never know that if you treat it like a promise book, you'll be disappointed. Train up a child in the way they should go so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. All things being equal, that's true. I mean, yeah, you give a child a pretty decent home, uh, you, you do, you know, they, chances are they're going to grow up to be pretty decent people. That's not always the case, though. It's just not always the case. And so parents, don't beat yourself up, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, there's something called free will. <laughs> there's something, there's other influences that can come in. What, it could be a host of things. Revelation sometimes undergoes that same sort of treatment, is that we expect one thing out of it, and then, but it gives us all sorts of other things. And, and, and the key here is to, before you even read Revelation, to understand is the genre, okay? Like Proverbs, like all these other texts. Okay, so what, okay, what, what is Revelation? What is its genre? It has, it has at least four different genres. Okay, the first one is this. Revelation is a letter... I always like to say this. Revelation is a letter. I, I do refer to it as a book sometimes. Um, but technically, it's not a book. It's not like a book that an author writes and publishes. It's a letter. John sat down to write a letter to seven churches. Okay, seven real churches in the ancient world. Each church was probably the size of this group, right? Small church. Maybe a little bit bigger in Ephesus, but Thyatira probably was a small church like this. Just us right here. You know, 30 people. It's a letter. It says it's a letter. Now, why is that important? Well, as soon as, as, soon as you say that Revelation is a letter, you have to admit a few other things. You have to admit that there was a motive for writing the letter. And you have to admit also that the letter was understandable. Because letters are modes of communication, and communication is only communication when the other person can possibly understand what it is you're writing. You see what I'm saying? We'll see this in a moment, but later on in a couple verses into Revelation, it says that blessed blessed, uh, is the one who reads this book or this letter or whatever it says, and, uh, and blessed are those who hear it. And then it goes on to say, and who keeps what's written in this book, who obeys it. Well, as one New Testament scholar said, Craig Keener, he says, you can't obey something you cannot understand. It must have been discernible, he says, because it's a letter. Okay. The other thing about it, as soon as you say it's a letter, is the minute you admit something. And this is kind of hard for us to admit, but we have to admit it. We have to admit that it was not written to us. It was written to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, Tyre, Sardis, and so forth, right? Ancient world. It was not written to you. It wasn't written to me. It was written to Ephesus and those those churches. Now, it was written for us. There's a lot for us there, but it was not written to us because it's a letter in the first century that was addressing specific situations there. Okay, I'm going to stop here. We're going to move on, but I'm going to come back to this whole piece, and we'll talk more about all that. Revelation is also an apocalypse. Okay, when I say apocalypse, what's the first image that comes to your mind? Total destruction. (laughs) Atom bomb, nuclear bomb. (laughs) Yeah, a cloud, right? Yeah, right. That's what comes to mind. 
Zombie. Oh, I, that's a good one. Yeah, like, you know, 10 years ago, it was all zombies, right? That's true. Zombie apocalypse. Yeah, apocalypse has taken on new meaning than it, than it had in the first century. Today, it means death and destruction, end of the world, Armageddon, whatever. Um, th- that's unfortunate because that's not what the word meant. Apocalypse, that word is not even an English word. It's a Greek word. It, it's the Greek word apocalypsis. Okay, and we just kind of Englishified it and said, hmm, apocalypsis, apocalypse. <laughs> just, it just what we do. But what, is, what does this word mean? Before I tell you, it's important to know that this is, um, uh, this is a word that occurs in the very beginning of Revelation itself. Revelation starts off with these three words, apocalypsis Jesu Christu, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The death and destruction of Jesus Christ. The end of Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. The apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The word apocalypse is, it's very simple, and all it means is to uncover, to unveil, to take that which is hidden and open it up so you can see the truth. Another word is reveal, or we might say revelation. See what I mean? Pretty cool. That's all the word means. It has nothing to do with death and destruction. Okay has nothing to do with the end of the world. It just means, hey, guys, you know that secret that nobody can understand? Here it is. Boom. Right. But it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what that means is that it, the whole point of this book is to show us who Jesus is. Because it's, a, it's an unveiling of Jesus Christ. My suggestion is never use the word revelation again to refer to this letter or book. Never do it again. Instead, pick a better word. Pick apocalypse. I like that. But then people are like, wow, that's a cool word. Okay, scratch that one, because it has negative connotations. Say, say something like the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Right? You could do that. Um, the revealing of Jesus Christ. I mean, that just, it, you know, you, what you want to do is make the Bible strange again. We're too familiar with it. We're too familiar with words like apocalypse and revelation. Get rid of them. Think strange. Think different. The unveiling of Jesus Christ. That gets people, like, if you say, okay, I was reading in the book of the Bible, you know, the one that called the unveiling? <laughs> what? Are you still smoking that stuff? Yeah, you know, that's what they say. No, do that because it gets people's attention, it gets your attention, and it makes the Bible different. Here. My goal is, let's read the Bible for, as if for the first time. You know, we have a lot of baggage when we come to the Bible. Get rid of it for just a moment, suspend it in, in the air, and then just come to it, read it as if for the first time. It, it's, it's a revelation about Jesus Christ. But it's also a revelation from Jesus Christ. That's the idea. It's a message from him. Okay? So, so let me back up. Um, the revelation genre is a, it's, it's a letter. It, we, the biblical word is epistolary. It's an epistle, a letter. It's also an apocalypse. This is not the only apocalypse that existed in the first century. There were many different Jewish writings called apocalyptic writings. And the apocalyptic writings, and you could read them. Like you could read First Enoch if you ever read Enoch. Don't read it at night. Have, have a semi-full tummy. <laughs> First thing now, it's interesting. Um, it's an apocalyptic book. It, and what's an apocalypse? They were very popular in the day. And essentially, an apocalypse is something that, um, well, it, 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 it seeks to communicate truth that is behind the veil, so to speak. Like, okay, guys, here's what's happening in the world. Here's what we're seeing with our own eyes. Let me give you the behind-the-scenes story. Let's take you to heaven. And sometimes apocalypses involve trips to heaven or angelic visitations and visions and all these, because you're peeling behind the veil, right? And that's, what, that's all Revelation is. It's just an apocalyptic text. Because it's an apocalyptic text, though, you have to understand that part of the genre of apocalypse is that it always uses symbols and signs. That's, the, that's one of its modes of communication, okay? We'll, we'll look more in that minute. Revelation also describes itself as a prophecy, okay? I'll talk more about that in a moment, but it is, it's a prophetic text. And see, we have all these different assumptions about what a prophecy is. We think it's, prophecy is all about prediction and fulfillment in the future, right? Kind of a Nostradamus with his crystal ball, it's cloudy, and he's, oh, this is going to happen in the year 2032, you know? That's prophecy. Ah, that's a modern pagan idea of prophecy. We want a Jewish version of prophecy, Okay, so we'll get to that in a moment. The last thing is that, according to some scholars, Revelation is a political cartoon. 
Have you ever seen those political cartoons that were famous back in the early 1900s and 1800s? If you didn't like a politician, say a president or a senator, whatever, somebody you didn't like, you just drew a funny picture of them. That The picture, though, is a caricature. How many of you guys have ever had a character done of you? I'm, I'm terrified of having a character done of me because what's a character? Well, it, it's made to look like you, but it's also made to exaggerate some of your unique features. I have a fairly long nose. Okay, don't make fun of me for this. I don't like my... Yeah, anyway, but in a character, it's going to look really long, isn't it? Or my teeth might look whatever, you know, whatever. My throat, Adam's apple, might poke out more. It's to make fun of you, right? <laughs> it's to have fun, right? That's why, uh, you know, not too long ago, you would have political cartoons. You could make, you know, for example, if, if you had a politician who was, I don't know, well-known for taxing people too much, right? Um, there might be a political cartoon in a magazine that shows the president, you know, coming out from a bank with a bunch of loot, right? And he's walking out because that's to signal that, oh, he takes our money, you know? So political cartoons do that. Revelation, and I think it's true, is a first century political cartoon. It's, it's, it's essentially about the Roman Empire. We'll, we'll get to that in the next couple of weeks, but, and we'll talk a little bit more about it today too. But that's the genre. If you don't know this, if you don't know these genres, it's hard to understand Revelation. Okay. What am I doing on time? Okay, <clears throat> let's start. Let's go back and talk about Revelation as a letter. I'm not making this up. I'm not, I'm not saying Revelation is a letter without any evidence to support that claim. In Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 9, this is verse 9 on your board. Here's what it says. He says, I, John, your brother who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance. I was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Okay? So the words in red there resemble Jesus. Those are to tell you that Jesus is speaking. But it just shows you that this is a, this is a book of visions, right? It, it's called a book here, but... But book mean, meant something different back then. A book was just another way of saying it's not a scroll. So scrolls were these long pieces of paper, right, longer than this, and they would roll up like this. You know how the scrolls work. But books were considered like new technology where instead of having all these pages on, you know, one long thing you had to roll up, you know, they invented a way to bind them in the column, in the spine. It was called a codex. And uh, over time... Uh, scripture began to put in codexes instead of scrolls. Because you can put a whole lot more in a little, I can almost put this in my pocket. You know what I mean? Scrolls, I'm not carrying a whole bunch. I can't do that. Um, so that, that's in, in this sense, it's more of a book, okay? But my point here, though, is just to say that it's a letter. That it was written to real churches. Each one of these churches existed in the ancient world. You can go to Ephesus today. It's in ruins, but it's there. And you can, you can go walk around and so forth. Um, uh, and, and these places are easily identifiable. These places are in modern-day Turkey. Okay, so this is a map of, uh, essentially the yellow is the Roman Empire, uh, around 100 AD. And then the red there is the western part of modern-day Turkey. And that's where um, uh, these seven cities were. Okay, I'll zoom in here. Okay, that's the red area. Now, you'll see... <clears throat> To the left and down a bit, there's an island there called Patmos. And just across the way there is Ephesus. Ephesus is the closest city to Patmos. John says that he was exiled on Patmos. Okay, or he doesn't say he's exiled. He said he's there on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Okay, what's going on there? Well, um, there's a lot probably going on there. And we have to know what's going on, or we at least need to investigate what's going on, because Revelation is a letter. And here's the thing. When it comes to letters, when it comes to letter writing, uh, you, you, well, let me back up. As soon as you say Revelation is a letter is the moment you confess the need to investigate the historical context of that letter. You know what I mean? Because it's a letter written in that time period. So if I want to know the letter... 
I need to I need to know more about the time period. To make matters a little bit more difficult, we only have his letter. We don't have conversations that they wrote to him or they messaged back to him, right? We just don't have that. It's a bit like, um, and I know you've never done this, but you know eavesdropping when someone's on the phone and they're around you, and you only hear one side of the conversation, but you hear certain key words on your side of the conversation that you're privy to, and they're key words, and it's a long conversation, but if you listen well enough, if you eavesdrop enough, and if enough key words are said, you can reconstruct the other side of the conversation. And, you know, uh, if you um, are an investigator, maybe a police officer, you can tap the phones, right? Uh, you know, you get both sides, but, you know, maybe, maybe you're in a position you can't. And so sometimes investigative work might need to reconstruct the other side. When we read the Bible and when we read letters, we have to engage in that reconstruction as well. Revelation, we have to do that. So what do we do? What, you know, if we, don't have the, if we don't have these other letters, if we don't have these other um, messages that the church has sent to John or whatever, what do we have to do? Well, we have to go do historical research. We need to go investigate these places. We need to research the time period. We need to see if there's other literature that was written around this time, archaeological findings, inscriptions, papyri, whatever. We need, to, we need that because that's good data to help us. And as it turns out, we have a ton of data from those cities because they wrote a lot of stuff down. The Romans were very good about record keeping, at least in this part of the world. And uh, so you'll be amazed in the next few weeks how much data that we'll bring in from extra biblical sources that will shed light on a lot of things for us, okay? But I just want to bring your attention to this map because Patmos is right across from Ephesus. And more than likely, by the way, Ephesus is the first uh, city mentioned here that the letter goes to. Um, and that makes sense because it's the closest to Patmos. The idea is that John wrote this letter and he sent it via a letter carrier. He couldn't have taken it on his own more than likely. Why do I say that? Well, because he says he's on the island on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. There are two ways we can interpret that. One is that he's there as a missionary and he's doing evangelistic work, possibly. It seems more likely, though, that he's there as, an, as a political dissident or an exile. Why do I say that? Well, because remember how he started off his letter? He says, I, John, your brother and your partner in the tribulation and in the suffering. He seems to be going through a hard time. And we know from extra biblical research, from historical data written in that period, that Rome... Um, punished its, its, um, its people in many different ways. Crucifixion was one way. Uh, uh, de- decapitation was another way. Um, for political dissidents, like if you if were a political rival to a Caesar or to a governor and you were found guilty, a lot of times they would just exile you. And some research that I've ran across suggests that, um, that they would exile older older people. They wouldn't necessarily like kill them just out of kindness. I don't know. Not that Rome knew how to be kind, but, but more than likely, John, if this is the apostle John, he's pretty old. Okay. And it would make sense why he's exiled uh, on, on Patmos. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Patmos was known to be a place of exile too. You know, I can't think of the source on that, but for some reason I want to say that. Um, so that makes sense. So he can't go to give this message to the people. Okay. He just can't do it. So he's going to send it to a letter carrier. And they're going to travel pretty much the way it's laid out. So look at that map. And if you, if you uh, pay attention to the way uh, the order is in Revelation 1 depicted, it's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum. So you look up Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum. You go straight up. And then you go down uh, to Tyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, down to Laodicea. You make this almost circular route. And uh, there were roads that would have connected those quite easily. Okay, they're in a small area there. Um, you've heard of the book of Colossians in the New Testament. Well, it's, it's not too far from Laodicea. I mean, this is a heavy spot. Ephesus, interesting fact, Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the whole of the Roman Empire. It was a bustling metropolis, like I think 250,000 people at the time. Ancient world, first century, is a pretty big place, right? Um, I think it's 250,000. Anyway, big city, okay? Um, it was a port, it was, a, it was set near the ocean, Today, that if you go look at Ephesus on a map, it's further from the ocean because of uh, the land has just shifted. That's just what happens over time. Um, so many cool things I could talk about there, but we'll just kind of move on. Um, what else do we want to say? Where am I pointing? There we go. Let me talk about letters in antiquity. 
Notice in Revelation 1, 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So in antiquity, it was very common to write a letter and then, and then have someone by you, like your secretary of sorts, and then that person would be charged with taking your letter to the people you were writing to. And once they got there, once they got to the location, that person would read the letter to the congregation or whoever they were writing to, okay? And that made sense because that person uh, needed to read the letter because that person was with the author and maybe could answer some questions back and forth if there were questions about what was meant. This is no doubt what's happened here. He's sending it to people, and that one person would read it to other. Because if you notice in this text, he says, blessed is the one who reads. This is singular in the Greek. Only one person reads it. But blessed are all those who hear and who keep it. In Greek, that's plural. Okay, so, you, so again, this is, conforms to how letters were sent in antiquity. Interestingly, if you go to other letters in the New Testament, like Romans, you'll notice something pretty fun. Um, Phoebe, who is a deaconess, she actually is the one that Paul says in the end of Romans, he says she's the one taking it. Well, he doesn't quite say it like that, but the assumption is that she's the one taking it to Rome and who will read it there. She's, she's the reader. Um, first person to read the book of Romans was Phoebe. But what's interesting, too, in Revelation, I mean, Romans 16, it says, you just start reading and Paul's like, greet this person, greet this person. And then it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, send my greetings. Who's Tertius? Well, Tertius was the one that Paul dictated the letter to, and he wrote it down, and he sent it. He just inserted, hey, psh, by the way, guys, hi, you know. Uh, but that was a common practice, too. So Paul's, you know, Paul's marching around wherever he's at, and he's dictating, and Tertius is writing. So that's the way it works. Um, that's how letters work. So we see, again, this is proof, at least some evidence to suggest that Revelation really was a letter in that sense. And again, as I said, since it's a letter, we have to inquire into the author's motives for writing. Why was he writing the letter? If I come across a letter and I, I find out it's a love note, ooh, right? Well, and I, I, can, I can read the letter and it sounds like a love note, right? Um, well, what's the motive for writing a love note? To express love, right? right? And if I want to know more information about these two people, if I know that it's a love note... Uh, you know, I can know, okay, there's a motive here. One motive is for the author to write the letter to express his or her love to the lover, right? And then I might, if I'm really interested or just plain nosy, I might find out more about why would the recipient want to read the letter in the first place. Turns out, after doing a lot of historical research, going to the National Archives and looking everything up, I find out that this is uh, a woman who's writing to her loved one in uh, Germany in World War II. He's off fighting a war. And I, I can just develop this whole history of, you know, that, that's not in the letter, but, but I can reconstruct the history through research. Many people do this who are like historians. This is how they do research. They reconstruct the world of the, the, the letters. Sometimes all they have is a letter, right, or a few letters, right? Maybe a few pictures here and there, but, but just enough to reconstruct the situation. Okay, if it's a letter, I'm going to inquire into the motives of the author. I'm going to inquire into why the readers want to read the, the thing anyway. So with Revelation, I'm very curious as to why these churches want or need to read this letter. Why do they want to read this letter? What's in this letter that makes me think that there's something applicable to them? Well, I've got to do some research and find that out. But my point here is that as soon as you admit it's a letter is the minute you dedicate yourself to investigate the history behind it. You have to. Now, again, as I said earlier, since it's a letter, I have to also admit that it was discernible and applicable to its original audience. If this was not discernible and understandable to its original audience, then it would not, there would be no point in writing a letter. There would be zero point. So that means when it comes to things like the beast or the mark of the beast or, you know, whatever, all those things, the first century audience would have to have understood what that meant. Otherwise, why put it in a letter, right? This is very important. And what that means is that we can know what the mark of the beast is, and we can know who or what the beast is doing a little historical research. You'd be amazed how much data we have outside the Bible that tells us about the beast. I'm going to show you writings, or at least refer to them in a later session, where they're 
writings outside of the Bible that also talk about a beast and who would have been well-known to these people in the first century. It's amazing, okay? Um, in other words, admitting it's a letter invites you to become a historian, to investigate the historical context of Revelation. So again, what's going on? Well, if you go back to look at that verse we read, he says, I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution. In some translation, that's the word tribulation. It's actually the word thlipsis, which in Greek is the word tribulation. Um, he says, I'm a partner with you in the tribulation, in the persecution. I'm a partner with you in the kingdom and in the patient endurance. So, so what's going on? What's he saying? Well, what I take this to mean is that he's going through trial. And, and he's on Patmos. It sounds like he's there for, for reasons of exile. He sees himself as part of a tribulation. Well, wait a second. I thought tribulation was something that happens in the future. Again, that's an assumption you might be bringing to the text. Don't do that. I mean, that might be right, but don't do that. Let the text inform your theological beliefs about the tribulation. Don't let your theological beliefs about the tribulation inform the text. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what ends up happening when we do Bible studies. We, we do Bible studies to reinforce what we already believe about the end times. We don't get from the Bible the beliefs of, for the end times uh, like that. We should start with the Bible. That's, the Bible is where we get our beliefs. But all too often, we make the Bible conform to our already stated beliefs about the end times. Don't do that, right? And so, so just take it for face value. Persecution. He's going through tribulation. The, the word persecution should be tribulation. In the ESV, it's tribulation. Man, he thinks he's in the tribulation. And it's patient endurance. He's, I'm, he's saying, I'm with you in the endurance. I'm with you in staying faithful to Jesus. And given what we know about political exiles, it seems like he's a political exile here. And as we get into, you know, the next few weeks, you'll see more evidence to know that this is about politics. I like to say Revelation is all about politics and religion. It's all about po- the two things we don't ever want to talk about. Politics, it's all about, Reve- it's all about it, okay? Uh, a lot. You'll see this in the coming days, okay? A um, couple other things here. I don't know where to point. Okay. Um, Okay, here's some more information. When you get into the message written to Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2, he says this. He says, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding fast to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan lives. A couple things I want to say about this. Clearly, there's enough tribulation for a Christian to be martyred. And uh, somehow John knows about this. I don't know what happened, but there's a Christian there who's been martyred. The idea, most scholars think, is that persecution was always a reality that they always had to, had to fear and stay in. Um, uh, so th- the book seems to be written by a certain John to comfort, to encourage a church that is going through persecution of some sort. That's what seems to be the case. I'll have a lot more to say about that later. Um, not today, but in the weeks ahead. Sorry. Um, okay, an apocalypse. I said Revelation is an apocalypse. You know what that means. We looked at that. The very first uh, in, uh, word in Greek is apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, you, we talked about that a moment ago. Um, that's the word. That's what it looks like in Greek, apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. Um. I talked about how apocalypse means to reveal, to unveil, to uncover, okay? Um, I want to bring this to your attention again here, too, because this really sums up exactly what an apocalypse really is. It's a mode of writing in the ancient Jewish world that sought to reveal the truth about the world by peeling back the veil of reality. Apocalypses entailed trips to heaven, communication with spiritual beings, all that stuff. That's all Revelation is. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago when I was talking about that, I said, that apocalyptic literature in the ancient world, it did communicate truth behind truth that was behind the scenes, right? That was the point. But the way it did it, if you look at apocalyptic literature in the first century, you'll notice that they employ all kinds of symbolic words and phrases that are not meant to be taken literally. As it turns out, Revelation tells us that very thing. So again, back in Revelation 1 verse 1, It says, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. 
He made it known. Note those red words. I'll say something about that. He made it known. What's the it? The revelation. Yeah. He made the revelation known by sending his angel to his servant, John. If you look at the behind in the Greek language there, the word he made it known is a samon. Uh, we get our, well, the word, it comes from the Greek word semino. Okay, what, what is that? Well, there's an English word called semiotics, and it's, it's, the, it's the study of signs. I know that sounds weird, but like there's a whole field in philosophy called semiotics, and it, it, it has some, some to do with language, like, you know, how, how, do we, how do we understand signs? You know, what does a sign represent? I mean, it, it, there's a lot to it. Um, so, for example, if I put a, a red octagon figure up here, you would know that resembles a stop sign. How does a stop sign tell us? What is it about a, the red, like on a red light? It just tells, We've been trained, even though that red light doesn't say stop, but the red light, we've been trained to see it. Because the red light there is a symbol for another truth, right? It, it points us to another word, stop. Well, there's a whole field of philosophy to tell us how all that works. It's pretty interesting. But it comes from the word uh, simino uh, here. So the way you can translate this, I think I put it up here. Now, let me go back. The way that you can translate it is, um, I messed it up. Ah. Let me go back here. Sorry, guys. Yeah, you could literally translate that as Jesus made the apocalypse known through signs and symbols. Because that's literally what the word asamon means. Asamonin. That's literally what it means. He made it known through signs and symbols. So even in verse 1, Revelation is telling us how to read Revelation. That God is communicating the truth through signs and symbols. That's how he makes known his revelation. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, in Revelation chapter 1, uh, there's this opening vision that John sees, and he, he, he sees Jesus, right? And he says, in his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining with full force. Now, let me stop there. He says that Jesus has a sword coming from his mouth. Does that mean that Jesus literally has a sword <laughs> coming from his mouth? It, no, no, it doesn't at all. That, that's a literal way to take this, but that's just a symbolic way of representing Jesus and Jesus' word. If, if you interpret this literally, then how could the bottom half be true? He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he placed his right hand on me, saying, don't be afraid. How can you speak if you have a two-edged sword protruding from your mouth? You see what I mean? That's only a problem if you interpret this literally, right? I mean, this is a very simple example. But you, you kind of get this weird contradiction if you interpret it literally. But it's not meant to be interpreted literally because just a few verses above this, it says God makes known his truth, his apocalypse, through signs and symbols. So let me ask you, when it says that he saw Jesus coming with a sword, double-edged sword coming through his mouth, what is that communicating to us? That his word is a, a weapon, a weapon of war. That's right. That's, that's right. And if you get so infatuated with the literal real sword, you just hung up on that, then you'll actually miss the true meaning. This is a really good rule of thumb for interpreting Scripture. In apocalyptic texts, literal interpretations can actually hinder meaning. They hinder you from getting meaning. See, we often think that the more literal you can be in interpreting the Bible, the better you are at getting meaning. Not always. Not always. In apocalyptic texts like this, that'll actually keep you from the truth. Okay? You need to interpret it symbolically. There's another scene where there's a, that John sees a lamb, and the lamb is opening up. The lamb represents Jesus, right? But the lamb is starting opening up the scroll, and it's sealed up with seven seals, and he's opening each seal. Well, one commentator rightfully says, you know, how can a, how can a lamb with hooves open seals? Up? I mean, it takes little appendages. Well, his, po his, yeah, no thumb, right? His point, though, is well taken. It's like, it's not meant to be taken literally. This is just, you know, if it's symbolic, you can do all sorts of things with symbolism that's not in real life, right? And that's what you see in Scripture, all the time in Scripture, in fact, in the Psalms. You can read a Psalm, and before you know it, you're reading about mountains 
you know, praising God and the stars declaring the glory of God with their words and the, the mountains and the waves of the sea clap. For, you know, this is just poetic language. In poetry, you can do anything you want to with words. That's what makes it poetic. It's beautiful. But the Bible, a lot of it's written in poetry. And apocalyptic uses metaphor and symbolism. So, I'm going to throw something out there. When it comes to texts like Mark of the Beast, should we take that literally, or should we do something else? Is it a literal mark on the forehead? Revelation 13, verses 16, 17, and 18. You got a mark on the forehead, or the hand. Interestingly enough, just two verses after that, one verse or two after that, it's Revelation 14, verse 1, talks about the mark of the Lamb that we get on our foreheads. And more than likely, that's a reference to the text in Ephesians, where Paul says that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, which is clearly invisible, right? So does the mark of the beast have to be a physical mark? Hmm. Not even so. What about Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 6, where John probably, is, John's very familiar with Ezekiel chapter 9. That's where God is about to destroy the temple, the Old Testament temple. He says, before you do it, angels, go around and mark up the righteous on their forehead. And don't touch them when you destroy everything. Well, that's a mark that's only visible to angels. Moreover, 100, 200 years before the New Testament was written, there was a book called the Psalms of Solomon, which is just a Jewish text. I think it was kind of a proto-Pharisee text or something. But it talks about a mark on the righteous and the mark on the unrighteous. My point is, the mark of the beast and the mark of the lamb do not originate with Revelation. I can point to two different texts that talk about marks. And, and, and those seem to help us understand the mark of the beast. It's really fascinating. We'll, we'll get into that in a, in a couple weeks or so. But I'm just saying, if this is symbolic, uh, I, I'm just saying it doesn't have to be literal. It could be symbolic in many ways. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So it, we, we've, we've said Revelation is a letter. We need to read it like a letter. Got to get into the context. Reconstruct the other side. You got to understand that's an apocalypse. That it's meant to reveal truth. Not this is funny. Revelation is the is often taken to be the most cryptic, mysterious book out there. And yet it's the very book in the whole Bible that calls itself Get the Truth Out There. You see what I mean? It's the book that is meant to unveil truth, not hide it, not to make it mysterious, but to make it not mysterious. And yet it's the very book that we think is the most mysterious which means that we're not reading it right. But if you read it as a letter, if you read it as, as an apocalypse, then you understand the point is to unveil the truth. That's why in Revelation 13, verse 16, 17, 18, where it says, talks about the mark of the beast, he says, here is wisdom. Those with wisdom, let them calculate the number of the beast and understand it. So what's funny is the mark of the beast is actually, at least according to Revelation, very easy to understand. But why do we misunderstand it all the time? I, how do, well, Matt, what do you, why do you think we misunderstand it all the time? Because it changes every 10 years what the mark of the beast is. Used to, it was a barcode, or three sixes on your license plate, or three sixes on your driver's license number, or, you know, it might have been um, maybe not a barcode, social security number. People were freaking out about that, right? Uh, true story, Ronald Reagan, Ronald and Nancy Reagan, they moved to Beverly Hills after the presidency, or somewhere in there. And they moved to a street, I forgot the name of the street, but the house number was like 666. They didn't like that, not because they thought it was the mark of the beast, but they didn't want other people to be talking about that, right? So they, I think, if I remember right, they petitioned the city to get it changed. <laughs> it's really interesting, right? My wife told me months ago, she said, hey, my driver's license number, it's kind of interesting. I got three sixes in a row. I said, of course you do. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I'm only writing a book on this stuff, and you've got my wife, yeah. But I know I don't worry about that because it's not. Like, but my point is, it's either microchip technology. Tech, you know, it's nanotechnology. It just changes all the time, right? So, well, which is it? Is it a social security number? Or micro, you know, my my point is, here's another thing. If this, if Revelation is a letter, and if it had to be discernible and understandable to the first century, would they have understood it immediately as a, a nanochip or microchip technology? No. Well, well, Matt, it was written for the future. Okay, but, but why tell them that? Why tell them about it if it has no application to them? Because when you read Revelation 13, it sure sounds like that they, uh, they need to be aware of the situation that the mark of the beast is going on. 
well, okay. So we might need to just, we might just need to back up and, and reassess certain things about this, okay? Um, I'll just say this now. I think the mark of the beast is a first century reality. I think it's going to be a future reality, and I think it's a present reality. Uh, but I don't. But a lot of people think it's just all future, right, or whatever. And I say, no, you misunderstand it. I think my view is that the mark of the beast. I'm not going to tell you exactly because we'll get to that. But the mark of the beast is probably. Well, there are many marks of the beast, right? Um, that um, that maybe we need to be more aware of, I suppose. But okay, we'll we'll get to that later. Revelation is a prophecy. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and keep what is written in it for the time is near. Again, he's saying that the original readers, um, you know, can be blessed if they read it and they keep it. You can't keep something you don't understand, okay? They, they, yeah, possibly, possibly when it went to Ephesus, a couple of options. It could have been seven copies initially. If you're in political exile, you may not have that. You may not have enough paper to do that, right? Papyrus especially is, super, is pretty expensive. He might have wrote one when it goes to Ephesus. Then it probably was copied, and then next one sent to the next church, copy next one, and then pretty soon it's all copied, right? Yeah. So that's a good question, very good question. I don't know the answer. I just I don't know, but but probably something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's what would have happened because they would have Ephesus would be like, oh, this is a great letter. Oh, we have to send it next to the next. No, we're gonna keep that. You know, like, well, let's just copy it. Okay, we can do that. Um. So the but it's it's called a prophecy. What do you mean by prophecy? Ah, oh, it's such a good word. The common view is this, that prophecy is all about predicting the future. That's what we think prophecy is. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's the only way to understand biblical prophecy. In Matthew 24, Jesus prophesies, and it's all about the future, at least from his perspective, okay? I think it's passed from our perspective, but nonetheless, he's predicting the future, he's prophesying, Okay, let's look at this. I'm just going to read this real quick. Um, uh, G- Jesus answered his disciples. I'm, I'm, I'm purposely getting right in the middle of things here, uh, but I'll, I'll get to the, the context in a moment. Jesus answered his disciples, them. He says, Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must soon take place. But the, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be fam- famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of birth pains. He goes on and talks about how the temple is going to be abominated and desolated and sacked and all that. Um, so he's prophesying. This is, he's probably preaching this in AD 30, okay? But it, it's a prophecy because it's about the future. That seems clear, but whose future are we talking about? Okay, well, let me read you the verses prior to that. Jesus came out of the temple and was going away. His disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Then he asked them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I tell you, not not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Hey, tell us when when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? There's a lot to this, but essentially what Jesus is talking about there is not he, he does say, they do ask him about when is your coming, but that might mean something, yeah, that's a whole can of worms. Uh, he, he does talk about his second coming, but when he talks about his coming, he also means something slightly different there too. But here he's talking about the destruction of the temple. He's talking about the disciples' future. We know from history that the temple was destroyed 40 years after Jesus spoke this in AD 70. The Romans come in and sacked it, totally destroyed it. It's never been rebuilt since. Even today, it's just, you know, it's never been rebuilt. Um, he's talking about the future. My point here is only that Jesus is predicting the future, and that's called prophecy. Okay, that, that makes sense. But there's another element to prophecy as well. Oh, uh, yeah, First Thessalonians 4. This is where Paul predicts the second coming of Christ. He's, he prophesies in a sense, right? Um, the Lord himself, with a cry of command, he, with an archangel's call, with the sound of God's trumpet, he will descend from heaven, the dead in Christ will rise first. He's talking about the second coming. He's talking about our future, okay? So, yeah, I, it's true. Prophecy is about predicting the future. So maybe Revelation is all about the future because it's call, it calls itself a prophecy. Okay, but is that all there is to prophecy? Well, prophecy is about predicting or foretelling the future. 
But prophecy is also about foretelling in the present time. There's two ways of understanding the word prophecy. Predict, predicting the future, and, and then also, or we could say foretelling the future. The other way is to see prophecy as uh, foretelling God's truth in the present time. I'm going to give you an example of this. Just don't take my word for it. In Matthew chapter 2, Jesus uh, is born, or Jesus is born around this time. And um, you know the story, right? He's born. King Herod's crazy. King Herod um, tries to kill all the babies. Where, where does Mary and Joseph go with Jesus? They go to Egypt, right? Well, after they stay in Egypt for a while and Herod dies, then the Holy Family comes back to, to Israel, right? And Matthew says that by coming back to Israel, he says, quote, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And what Matthew's doing there, he's quoting from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. So if you go to Hosea 11, verse 1, you'll see those words in green. Out of Egypt I have called my son. What's funny, though, is when you read that in context, Hosea is talking about Israel when she left Egypt on her own exodus, that, that story. And in context, what's fun is that God there, he's the one talking, He's saying something like, I remember when I saved my son. Israel was often called God's son. I remember when I saved my son and, uh, you know, I, I wooed them. I took care of them. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Well, Matthew here uses that as a prophetic fulfillment when he applies it to Jesus. Jesus is coming from Egypt, fulfills that prophecy. What's, what's funny, though, is... Um, uh, in the original context, that's not even a prediction. Like, Hosea's not predicting anything. He's, he's not even talking about the future. He's actually talking about the past. And he's just making a statement. Yep, I remember one time, out of Egypt called my son. Matthew takes that and says, oh, this is a prophecy about Jesus. And he fulfills it. What, how can Matthew do that? What is he doing? Well, it's because Matthew is a good Jew. He doesn't think prophecy is all about predicting the future. Okay? He doesn't think that. There's something else about Jewish prophecy that's different than just predicting the future. According to Matthew, what he thinks Jesus is doing is just reenacting the story of Israel's exodus. He's react Matthew depicts Jesus as reenacting not just Jesus from the, going from the exodus, uh, or the story of Israel in, in their exodus. Matthew depicts Jesus as reenacting the whole story of Israel. Think about it. If you've read Matthew, the opening sections, you know this. Um, Jesus is born, right? And then um, he... Uh, Oh, Herod gets mad, and he wants to kill all the babies. Sounds a whole lot like Pharaoh, the, but, the, but the, the Israel is taken uh, away and protected. Then Israel goes through the Exodus, goes to the Promised Land. Jesus leaves Egypt, goes back to the Promised Land. What happens next? Je well, and if you read the story, uh, Jesus grows up. It's a quick, fast trip to growing up there. But he grows up, and he goes to the Jordan River and is baptized. Now, the Jordan River is a pretty important piece in Israel's history because J Israel crossed through the Jordan to go to Canaan, right? And scholars say it was probably around that point right there where they crossed. So Jesus is reenacting the story of Israel by himself crossing through the waters of the Jordan. And it's then where Jesus begins his ministry. It's at that point he really begins his ministry, just like Israel begins her kingdom after that point. The next thing that Jesus does is he goes into a wilderness. Uh, oh, by the way, at the Jordan River, he rises out of the water and there's a voice that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Remember that part? Well, that was one thing that God could never say about Israel. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. No, it was like, I'm always disappointed with you guys, right? So Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is reenacting the story of Israel in himself because he's the faithful Jew. He's the faithful Israelite. And so Jesus rises up. He's a faithful son. He immediately goes into a wilderness for how long? 40 days. Oh, wow, what a coincidence. Yeah, Israel is in a wilderness for 40 years. What does she do in the wilderness? She's tempted. She goes through trial, and she fails. <laughs> Jesus goes through temptation, goes through trial, and he wins. And he's even tempted at much the same thing Israel was, about food, right? Manna, Israel's complaining all the time. Jesus trusts God. Israel worships false gods. Jesus refuses to. He's reenacting the story of Israel. He, su he succeeds. He goes through the wilderness, su successful. He's the true Israelite. He's the true Jew. He is Israel embodied in flesh. Then what happens? Oh, well, Matthew chapter 5 happens, of course. What's that? Jesus climbs up a mountain, starts teaching from a mountain, the Sermon on the Mount, talks about commandments and stuff, and, and uh, how you love your, 
who's the last guy in the Old Testament to climb a mountain and tell Israel what to do? Moses, Mount Sinai. My point is this. Prophecy for Matthew is not just about predicting and fulfilling. It's about acting and reenacting the story of Israel. That's how, you, that's how Jesus fulfills Israel's prophecies. Not because those were like predictions. Like no, You have to get out of your mind, Nostradamus predicting the future in a crystal ball. That's not how Jewish prophecy worked. They believed that certain stories would be reenacted, and that would be fulfillment. You see what I mean? So um, Jesus is reenacting the story of Israel. So prophecy is prediction fulfillment, but it's also act and reenactment. In other words, we can put it like this. Prophecy is foretelling, but it's also forth-telling. You see what I mean? It's, it's foretelling about the future, but it's also forth-telling about the present. What does it have to do with Revelation? Well, it has a lot to do with Revelation, actually. Because Revelation, if it's a prophecy, then it doesn't mean that everything in it has to be about predicting the future. What it could be about is just just forthtelling these churches or preaching these churches how to live in the present time and what their role is in the story of God as well. And if we have ears to hear, Revelation is always saying that, he who has ears to hear, if we have ears to hear, then maybe we'll find ourselves in the story. Well, my, why I'm bringing this up is that just because it says it's a prophecy doesn't mean that everything in it's going to be, that everything in it is all about the future. That's one mistake everybody makes. no. A lot of it has to do with our past, the first century context of Ephesus. You'll see this in the next couple of weeks. There are as many things in it that is about our future. The second coming of Christ, he's going to return. I do believe that. So there's some things, but I'm just saying we have to remember that when you read Revelation, don't think it's all future. Don't think the four horsemen of the apocalypse is all future. There's nothing in the text that says it's future. The four horsemen of the apocalypse... One horseman is about famine. One is about economic injustice. One is about death and destruction. One is about war, right? We've seen that for like the past 2,000 years. And, and I, I actually say in my book, it's not published yet, but I say in my book, I say, I say maybe Christians today have been so focused on interpreting the four horsemen of the apocalypse as all about the future that we've been blinded to the fact that they've already arrived. And maybe that's Satan's tactic all along is to get us focused so much on the future and speculating about the future, that we're blinded to the activities of Satan in the present. It's a fall, yeah, fall, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I totally believe that this whole famine, death, and destruction, that's future too. You still get the future stuff with the view I'm proposing, but you also get a rich way of relevancy. Revelation is relevant for today, okay? Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk much about this. We're about done. Uh, kind of gone over time a little bit, but I'm, this is the end. I mentioned that Revelation is a political cartoon. We'll get more into this later uh, because I didn't plan on talking about a lot of this tonight because we'll get into it. <sighs> Revelation depicts certain first century political leaders in cartoonish fashion. In the ancient world, Caesar, uh, the, the emperor, the Roman emperor, he and his family, they were worshipped. Okay, they, 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 had, they even had temples dedicated to them, like, like ch- what we would call churches. And they had priests that, were, that like, got paid to you know, take your sacrifices to Caesar. Uh, in the, 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 uh, that western part of Turkey on that map that I showed you, what we call Asia or Asia Minor, there was, Asia was a Roman province. Kind of like Oklahoma is a state of the United States. Well, Asia was a Roman province of the empire. And in, that, in, in the Asian province, they, uh, they were Greek-speaking, okay? And they believed that, um, as the Greeks always kind of believed that it was okay to worship living human beings. It was kind of weird. Uh, the, Roman in, the Romans in, in the city of Rome, they didn't do that. They thought... That, yeah, we can worship our emperors, but we only really need to worship them after they die, right? Um, and there's some, some stuff behind that. So basically, Julius Caesar was essentially the first emperor, but he was murdered. And um, after he dies, he goes, he, he just dies, and they bury him or whatever. Or they probably burn his body. But anyway, he, he dies, and um, the Roman Senate... Okay, so the Senate actually, there's some myths about the Roman Empire. It wasn't technically like a dictatorship with the emperor up top. He had to please his senators, right? 
But they also better pleased him. It was a weird, it just depend. it just is a weird uh, political configuration. Um, the Senate, though, voted to deify Julius Caesar. So after he died, Julius Caesar became a god. And they worshipped him. Uh, but only after he died, right? Um, and by the way, see, Julius adopted a guy named Octavius, Octavius, who later becomes Augustus, who's mentioned in Luke chapter 2 that we read, right? Or that, that uh, you, you're familiar with. Um, so, but what's interesting is when Julius Caesar died and his son Octavius is left, he gets the throne, essentially. If your dad is God, then who do you get to become? Son of God. Yeah. Augustus was known as the son of God or son of a God. And even on Roman coins, he would have like his image with the title son of God on it or Lord and Savior or something like that. Interestingly enough, in we, in, we have some archaeological inscriptions I could show you if you're ever interested. Um, these archaeological inscriptions were found in the year 9 B. They're, they're written in the year 9 B.C., so nine years before Jesus was born. And uh, it's interesting, there was, a, there was a contest in that area of the world where um, they were like, hey, we love Augustus Caesar. Man, he's great. The son of God he is. How could we honor him? Well, they took, a, they took a contest. They're like, whoever comes up with the best idea how to honor Caesar, get a prize or something. And so everybody submits their proposals. One guy's proposal was this, and he won. He says, well, why don't we do this? Let's take Caesar's birthday and make that our new year, the, day, the first day of our year, our business year or whatever, our fiscal business year. And they're like, that's a great idea. So they wrote up this proposal. And the, what's funny is the way the proposal is read, it's interesting. It says, it says things like, Caesar Augustus, the one who brings peace to the world. His birth is good news, gospel. Literally, it's gospel. His birth is gospel that brings good tidings to all people. He's brought peace to earth uh, and all of that. This is fascinating because when you read Mark's gospel, he depicts Jesus's birth as the good news that brings peace to the world. In other words, what Mark is doing is he's purposely saying Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, the word gospel was, was a was, was a word used by the pagans before it was used by the Christians. He, but but that, was the, that was the idea. The gospel was that Caesar has brought peace to the world, and he kind of did. Like, he, he made the world peaceful because, you know, he just executed everybody who didn't like him. So, but it brought a lot of peace. It was called the Pax Romana, Roman peace. And, um, and so people loved it. They have stability and all that jazz, right? Economy's great, you know, all that. And, um, and, 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 but he made boastful claims about himself. But he didn't, but, but here's the thing, people wanted to worship him, in Asia Minor, that is. Everybody else is like, oh, we won't worship him until after he dies, because that's what Romans do. But the Greeks in Asia, they're like, let's do it now. And that's just what they did. Well, Augustus, you know, and other emperors agreed to it, you know, okay, yeah, but, but he had to do it carefully. He didn't want to offend the Roman Senate, because they wouldn't like that. So he says, oh, you don't have to do that, but if you really want to, you know. You're not going to get a problem for me. Rome appreciates your patriotism. And so what ended up happening is that the province, Asia province, would, all the cities there would compete. I, you know, Ephesus, I want, a, I want a Roman temple that dedicates to the worship of Julius Caesar and all of his family to honor Augustus. Well, Smyrna and other cities, no, I want it. I want the Roman temple. We only have so much cash, guys. Only want to get it. So they would go to Rome, send a delegation. They would like literally fight like the Olympics. Who gets the, who gets the big thing in the city? There were literally competitions for this, and kind of like the Olympics. Well, Ephesus, Pergamum, and Smyrna, all three had, uh, had temples dedicated to the worship of Caesar by, I think, AD 90. And some of them had two temples. And, and, and these were just the state-sponsored temples. There were lots of other altars. Some benefactors would build small temples here and there for them, too. My point is this. Caesar was not only a political uh, leader, he was a religious leader too, with his own priests and everything in this part of the world, Pergamum, Ephesus. I can show you data to, to back this stuff up. Well, okay, what does this have to do with it as a political cartoon? Many scholars think that what he's really doing, what John is really doing, is he's, he's saying, look, the world thinks that Caesar is the best. I'm going to suggest to you, says John, that Caesar is a beast. And he's empowered by Satan. He's not empowered by anything good. Uh, there's actually extra biblical data to show that writings from this period uh, talk about Nero, who was an emperor, and Domitian, who was an emperor. It refers to them as beasts. 
So if I have extra biblical data that refers to these people as beasts, and I have John writing about a beast, I mean, it, it's not a far stretch to say they might be writing about the same thing. There's lots of other data to back that up. My point is, John's probably using the symbol of a beast to refer to, um, uh, to make fun of Caesar, that, that he's not a rational player. He's a monster without a brain, right? That's sort of the idea. Same with the harlot of Revelation 17. Many scholars are going to say that this represents Rome. Uh, she, the, har, the harlot here, according to Revelation 17 and 18, they, it's a city that, um, that prostitutes the nations, uh, in a sense that takes from the nations, pillages them, and uses it for her own glory. That's what Rome did, right? They, they pillaged colonialism kind of thing, ancient colonialism, just, just, you know, basically said, give me all your gold. We'll give you protection. You give us all your gold. And so the harlot there is depicted most likely as Roma, who was the Roman goddess that represented Rome and, and so forth. So anyway, political cartoon, we'll get more into that. My suggestion is this, and I'll end with this statement. Um, if you read Revelation with knowing it's a, li- it's a letter, and therefore you've got to do some historical homework, and if you read it as um, a prophecy and an apocalypse, and if you read it as a political cartoon, everything will begin to make a lot of sense. And more importantly, you'll begin to see how you can, how you can um, apply those truths to even the 21st century. There are 21st century beasts out there. There are 21st century mark of the beasts out there. And there will be future marks of the beasts. There will, you know, all these things. And, and, and I, think, I think Revelation will offer Christians a political vision. Because the word gospel was originally a political word announcing that Caesar is the Savior. The, the, God, the New Testament says, let me give you our politics. No, Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not. Right? So that Revelation is a very practical book in that sense. So, thank you. We're done. <laughs>